Let's open up our Bibles to book of the prophet Micah chapter 5. Verse 1. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. And then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain. Because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. And Lord, we come before you this morning now asking you to dial our hearts and our minds into um, reception, Father, into understanding. Into a time where we can take in the instruction of your word as well as the application of it. That we would be taught of your word, fed by your word, and then motivated through the power of your word, into lives that are changed. And we recognize, Lord, that this works when your spirit is our guide, our teacher. So we pray, Holy Spirit of the living God, come and reveal to us what you have for us this morning. And may you be glorified in this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Well, the countdown has begun. It's 129 days, 13 hours, 24 minutes, and 13 seconds till Christmas. Oh, 10 seconds. To 9 seconds. Till 8 seconds. It's 129 days, 13 hours, 24 minutes, and 4 se- 3 seconds. 2, 1. Wow, we are getting close. You can get these nice little iPhone apps if you'd like one on your phone or on your Android device. I know they have them from that. If you'd like to start tracking Christmas right now. <laughs> It's almost upon us. Christmas is just about here. I know what some of you are thinking. Dude, it's August. (laughs) I love Christmas. What can I say? I'm not one of those among us who start to give the old boz and humbugs if we play a Christmas song in worship before Christmas Eve. You know who you are. (laughs) But if you want to talk about early for Christmas... 700 years before the first Christmas, Micah told us where it was going to happen. And he's not the only one, by the way. A number of the prophets began speaking of these things seven, eight, nine hundred years before they took place. Micah, again, 700 years early. But the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew, draws from Isaiah, from Micah, from Hosea, and from Jeremiah, all within the first chapter or two, To point out the reality of the birth of Christ. All these prophets who so many hundreds of years ago gave a divinely calculated message of when Messiah would come into the world. Micah chapter 5 is one of those messages. I came to this and I was thinking, is there any way I can push this out until Christmas? Could maybe I stay in Micah chapter 4 for four months and then we could get, you know, it didn't work out that way. So here we are in August, but it didn't seem to bother Micah, so it's not going to bother me. They are exact, these prophets, in person, in place. They're exact in period of time, even in the perils that would surround the birth of this Messiah King. And all the information was there to be heard. Matthew, as I said, took hold of these different prophecies. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, he quotes Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Saying, Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, as we sang earlier, God with us. Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, quoting from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, do little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, quotes Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Which reads, when Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. 
That's a remarkable prophecy. In fact, all of these, if you put them together on a little whiteboard and try to walk through them, they don't fit each other. They don't work together. You've got a, a child born in Bethlehem who will be called a Nazarene but must come out of Egypt. How do you do that? And by the way, there's going to be weeping in Ramah. Well, I thought he was going to be born in Bethlehem. What's this got to do with anything? Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. He quotes Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. A voice is heard in Ramah. Lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And Matthew points out, Jeremiah spoke those words about the slaughter of Herod. When he had all the male children in Israel under the age of two, had them slaughtered so that he could keep this Messiah King from coming into the world. His infanticide, my friends, covered around a square mile area, a sweep, if you will, around Jerusalem of 12 to 15 miles. Bethlehem is six miles south of Jerusalem. Ramah is six miles north. It was part of the whole sweep of the massacre of these children. No wonder weeping was heard up in Ramah when Messiah was born. The point is this. Even for Herod's massive slaughter, there was no stopping the countdown to that first Christmas. The hours ticked away, the minutes ticked by, the seconds, and finally Jesus was born right on schedule. His coming was inevitable. It was unstoppable. Isaiah the prophet tells us this, chapter 9, verse 6, A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And note this, the government will rest on his shoulders. First two have happened, the third is yet to be. But it will happen. Just as surely as it happened in his first coming, the child born, the son given. His name will be called Wonderful. Counselor. I know people put Wonderful and Counselor together. I put them separate because the name of Jesus we see a couple of different times in the Hebrew Scriptures. The Messiah is just called Wonderful. And he is. And he is also Counselor. Yes, he's a Wonderful Counselor. He's Mighty God. He is Eternal Father Prince of Peace. So the child came right on schedule. And yet another countdown continues for Israel. And we see that in this passage as well. Not a countdown to the first coming of Messiah, but to the second. A countdown, we might say, to peace. And there's no stopping it. Peace will come. Because the sun will return. The countdown to peace. I want to walk through this. I shared first hour. One of the challenges in in teaching the word is that there are two kind of, it's a double-edged sword, if you will. Bible teaching needs to be about instruction. We need the instruction of the word of God. Simply going through it, and if for nothing else, learning what it all means, verse by verse, understanding. But there's also application, where you and I have the tendency to read through something and say, okay, what do I do with this? We're going to do both this morning, instruction and application. But instruction first. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Let's think through this and understand the context of what's going on. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us with a rod. They will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. And I read that and think, wait a minute. That's not a verse in a little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. The siege and ramparts are against us as... Today we die. I mean, that's not part of the song, right? So why is this verse here? Understand that this is actually more likely the last verse of chapter 2 than it is the first verse of chapter 5. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, this is verse 14 of chapter 2. And the reason is because it sums up, it concludes a stanza of teaching that begins in the ninth verse of chapter 4 and runs through this first verse of chapter 5 before then we get on to the next prophecy. Let me show you how this works. This final stanza of chapter 4, we already studied on Wednesday night, is connected by a series of four nows. The Hebrew word is atah, and it, it means now or henceforth. And it's a progressive line of thought. Beginning in verse 9, note this, Now, why do you cry out loudly, there is no king among you? Or has your counselor perished, that agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? Rive and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion. Like a woman in childbirth. For now, you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, and go to Babylon. Who's he talking to? 
Just be clear about that. Is that is he talking to Mary? Anyone want to take a guess? Who, who maybe the prophet's talking to here? Israel. Thank you. <laughs> All of Israel, daughter of Zion. Understand the context that this whole prophecy, even Micah 5 verse 2, sits in the context of a prophecy to Israel. And he's speaking to Israel and he's saying, writhe in childbirth. Write as though you were a woman in labor. Dwell in the field. Again, verse 10, go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. From there, the Lord will redeem you from the hands of your enemies. And they did go to Babylon, just as Micah said, about 100 years later. And they were rescued from there ultimately 70 or so years after that. They came back into the land, just as Micah said they would, among all the other prophets. Verse 11. And now, there's another atah, now many nations have been assembled against you who say, let her be polluted and let our eyes gloat over Zion. And as I pointed out midweek, we see that going on right now. As nations once again, remarkably, are lining up to gloat over Israel and to point a finger and to say, down with this country, they're the problem in the Middle East. I love verse 12. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. And they do not understand His purpose. He has gathered them, that is the nations, like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion. For your horn I will make like iron, and your hoofs I will make like bronze, that you may pulverize many peoples, that you may devote to the Lord their unjust gain and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek." What Micah describes in that whole stanza leading up to before we get to the birth in Bethlehem. He describes a ticking trauma, an increasingly antagonistic atmosphere going on against and in Judah. Another countdown, not a countdown to peace, but a countdown to Jerusalem's devastation by Babylon and ultimately devastation by Rome, which would happen another 500 years after that. Micah chapter 1, it's interesting, it uses the word siege. That word siege, it's matzor in the Hebrew, and it is only used in the Bible to describe the siege against Babylon. Now you'll see the word siege in other places translated in various ways, but there are different words in the Hebrew. The word here, matzor, is only used of Babylon. As in 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 10. It says, at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, went up to Jerusalem, and the city came under Matsur, siege. Jeremiah 52, verse 5. So the city was under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. So when it's talking about Babylon specific, that word is specific for siege. Part of the reason why verse 1 is a prophecy of the Babylonian devastation. That's what he's talking about there. You may have caught something else, however, in verse 1. With a rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. When I first read that, I thought, that's Jesus. And if you know anything about teaching here, I have a tendency to look for Jesus everywhere. Okay, my assumption is he's in every chapter. My assumption is throughout the Hebrew scriptures, we see Jesus all over the place, and we do. And so when I saw the judge of Israel being smited on the cheek or smitten on the cheek, I thought, oh, well, that, that's got to be Jesus, right? That would put it out of context. Understand this. I don't think it is Jesus that's being talked about in that verse. It's out of place. The context implicates Babylon, the siege of Babylon. Jesus was not smitten on the cheek at the siege of Babylon, if, if we're correct in that. Furthermore, Jesus was never under siege from a foreign enemy. In fact, it was his own people who handed him over to Rome. Zechariah 13, verse 6, one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will say, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. If anyone understands betrayal of friends, Jesus does. If you've ever been betrayed by a family member or friend, please understand, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. He's been there. It says, with a rod they will smite the judge of Israel. That's another hint there. The word rod is Shabbat in the Hebrew. The word judge is Shaphat. Shabbat Shaphat. And what Micah is doing is what he does a lot. We can't see it in the English, but in the Hebrew, he's punning all the time. He's 
pun it off one word to another. He does this a lot in his book, and that's, this is one of those examples. And so the rod is for this particular Shaphat, this judge, this governor. Well, Jesus wasn't struck with rods. He was struck with fists. Matthew 26, verse 67 says, They spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? In addition, Jesus is more than a judge, more than Shaphat. I understand that all judgment has been given by the Father to the Son. And he has the right to judge. But that's not what this is saying here. He's more than that. Jesus is more ruler, king, one who has dominion, as with the word down in verse 2, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. That's the word mashal. That's talking about Jesus. I believe Micah in verse 1 of chapter 5 is referring to Judah's last king, Zedekiah. The one who would be smitten on the cheek with a rod, the the judge of Israel, who would be driven out, taken off to Babylon. Actually, his eyes would be put out right after watching all of his sons slaughtered. So the last thing that he would see in his life would be the death of his sons. They were brutal back in those days. And Babylon carried off Zedekiah. The final judge, the final governor, the final king, if you will, of Israel. And it was devastating. Why? Because for the Jewish people, it would seem the end of the Davidic dynasty. There goes the last king of Judah. And then Israel goes into captivity. And by the way, since that time, there has not been a single king of the line of Judah to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Since the Babylonian captivity. So 2,500 years. Things would not improve much. Judah would return from Babylon. Yes, they would rebuild the temple. Yes, not not a very big temple. Kind of a, a sorry thing compared to Solomon's temple. And they would live in conflict for the next four, five hundred years. The ticking trauma continues in that time that we call between the testaments. You know, from the end of the of the prophet Malachi to the last of the Hebrew prophets, John the Baptist. It was about 400 years. And during that 400 years, people call it the silent years because they're like, God didn't do anything. Nothing happened. Nothing was written. No prophets came. And yet during that time, the Persians and the Greeks and the Egyptians, the Syrians, constant battles from north to south with little Israel sitting right in the middle. Israel would writhe as if a woman in labor, which is what we just read in chapter 4. She would be in pain like a woman in childbirth. Can you imagine that, ladies? 2,500 years of labor. Mm. And you thought you went long. I thought, you know, Cheryl's first labor was difficult enough for me. (laughs) There was no peace for them, though. Just oppression all the way through that time. No word of hope. Just struggle and difficulty to survive, trying to stay together until they were finally completely driven out of the land, and then no peace whatsoever. Sent out among the nations, and that arrives us at verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you will go forth for me, one uh, to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And few verses in the Bible are more divinely packed than this one. The things that we learn here, that that's shared here, are remarkable. Bethlehem. You Bible students know Bethlehem. House of bread. The house of bread. It's Bethlehem Ephrathah. Ephrathah means fruitfulness. It means it means a fertile field. And it was so named because in many ways Bethlehem sat in the breadbasket of Israel back in the day. And it was a fertile land with good, rich soil. Originally, even before the name Bethlehem was ascribed to the city, it was just called Ephrath. Ephrath was the, the name, Genesis thirty-five nineteen. Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. Micah here gives us the full name, Bethlehem Ephrathah, to be absolutely specific about which Bethlehem we're talking about. Because up in the land of Zebulun, there is listed in the Bible another Bethlehem. So just to be clear that we're not missing, you know, the child's born in one, but we went to the other one. You want the wise men to go to the right place, right? So Bethlehem Ephrathah is specifically named. 
Rachel was buried there. Ruth and Boaz were married there. They had a son as they settled down in Bethlehem, a son named Obed. And Obed married and settled in Bethlehem. He had a son named Jesse. Jesse married and settled in Bethlehem, and he had a son named David. And David had a son who would also be born in Bethlehem. A child born of the line of Judah, of the line of David, of the correct line all the way down, arriving at Jesus Christ, the son of David, born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Just as Micah said. Now, you know, I gotta say, just one prophecy like that in the Bible is pretty mind-blowing. All you gotta do is tell me that Micah called the birth of Jesus 700 years before it happened, and I'm in. I'm good. But there is a plethora of these verses. There is no other book we've talked about, no other religious writing or book in, in the world. Not the Quran, not the writings of Baha'u'llah, only the Bible has such specific prophecy that we can see spoken and fulfilled. Over a third of Scripture is prophecy. It's remarkable. Matthew says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. And that's made very clear. The one who is right to sit on the throne, the rightful heir. Of course, remember from last week, Matthew twenty two forty two, Jesus said, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, The son of David. And he said, Well, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Well, answer, because he's both David's son and his Lord. Because he both came after David in the lineage of David, but he also came before David, this one who would be born in the house of bread. Jesus said in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But here's the question. For all of this prophecy, for all of this heritage, for all of this fruitfulness, and even the specific point, Bethlehem Ephrathah, why didn't Israel see him? Why did the Jewish people miss his arrival as so many did? Even the scribes of Herod knew that was the birthplace of Messiah. Turn in your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king... Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Why was he troubled? Because Herod was not the rightful king. Herod wasn't even a Jew. You know what Herod's lineage was? I'll give you a hint. We just studied this lineage in the book of Obadiah. Herod was an Edomite of the line of Esau and had no right to be sitting on the throne. He was a puppet ruler that was put on the throne by Rome, not of the tribe of Judah, not a Jew at all. He was an Edomite usurper. No wonder he would be a bit concerned about a Jewish Messiah coming into his land. So he's troubled. All Jerusalem is troubled. Verse 4 tells us, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. See, he couldn't look it up himself. Don't be a Herod. Don't be one who has to say, well, i got to go ask Pastor Rick where to find that. Because, you know, look it up. You have Bibles, right? Okay. That's the last email I'm going to get on a Sunday. (laughs) He asked them where Messiah was going to be born. Verse 5, they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And then they quote Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And they got it wrong. Well, they got the right place. And they got the right prophecy, but they quoted the prophecy incorrectly. You see, Micah had called, and just keeping your eye on that, listen to what Micah called Bethlehem. He called it too little to even be among the clans of Judah. What do the scribes here say? You are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. 
Why do they change it? Why do these guys pad the prophecy? Why? Because Messiah can't come from a little podunk village. That's just not okay. Why? Because they had knowledge without faith. Because they knew what the prophet said, but they didn't quite like it. It didn't fit their paradigm of a Messiah who would be glorious. You can't have a Messiah coming out of Cedro. <laughs> Too little to even be among the towns in northern Washington. Concrete? No offense if you're from Cedro or Concrete. I'm just saying Messiah's not going to come from there, is he? And he did. Well, not from Cedro. <laughs> he came out of Bethlehem, but they're reading it wrong. Oh, well, yeah, well, Bethlehem, I mean, uh, that's embarrassing. Too little. <laughs> no way. It's got to be by no means least. That, that's more like it. And so they alter Scripture. Do you ever do that? You ever pad the promises or shore up the Scriptures because of your own uncertainty? Add a few words that really weren't there because <laughs> God needs your help. I've done it. You're talking to someone about the Lord and you quote a verse and you just add a bit or leave out something is more likely. Let's leave the judgment part out of that. You know, John 3.16 is great, but let's skip (laughs) going on past that. We do that, gang, when our faith is uncertain. A lack of faith causes me either to add to or subtract from the Word of God, which is what these scribes do. It's what Eve did. All the way back in the beginning, remember she's having the conversation with the serpent. The serpent says, you're not supposed to, you can't have the fruit of this tree. What's the deal with the trees and the fruit? And Eve's response is, the Lord said, you shall not eat from it or touch it. God didn't say they couldn't touch the tree. He just said, don't eat it. You can lean up against it if you want. If you want to sit under it for some shade, that's cool. Just don't eat the fruit. He didn't say don't touch it. Eve added that. Why did she do that? That's not a big deal, is it? It betrays her uncertainty. It lets the serpent in that moment know that she is uncertain enough that she's got to kind of, you know, add something to it. Build a fence that God didn't even put there. Listen, when it comes to the Word of God, the Lord says Himself, Isaiah 45, 23, I have sworn by Myself. He's the only one who can do that. Okay? I can say, hey, I swear by Rick I'm going to keep my word, and you can go, whatever, I, I know about Rick. But when God says, I swear by Myself... By the only one who is truth, by the only one who is eternal, by the only one who is perfect, I swear by myself. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. It's going to happen. His word that goes out is his word. Let's just leave it at that. Let it be his word. And if you're uncertain about it, or if you're doubting, or if you're fearful, don't add to God's word. Just add more of God's word to your life. And you'll be in good shape. So there's this uncertainty among Herod's scribes. They knew the word, but they completely missed the person of Messiah. And that's the first thing to know. Go back to Micah chapter 5 now. And watch, watch what Micah tells us. He first describes the person of Messiah as being greater than human perception. The person is greater than than the scribes had even perceived, could understand. Verse 2, latter part of the verse says, From you, from Bethlehem, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity, from everlasting. I love that. Yamim Olam, days everlasting. And we, we've discussed in here how bizarre that is. You know, most of us can kind of conceive, although it's a little weird, but we can kind of conceive of eternity from today forward. I'm okay looking forward. Looking back is what freaks me out. You know, when my kids say, Dad, when was God born? And I say, He wasn't. He's just always been. Doesn't that, if, looking back, that there's always been eternity. That there... That there has never been a, a beginning of the realm of God, of the spirit realm. I look at that and go, what? And yet that is the description of this Messiah. One from days of eternity. 
one who has always existed, one who will be born of a woman into the world, absolutely, but he has always been prior to that birth. And this isn't some of this new age stuff, well, I've always been floating out there in space. No, you haven't, you idiot. You just got born <laughs> into the world. That's where we all had a start. Okay? Jesus has always been. The person of Messiah is greater than human perception. And by the way, that's how he can be both David's son and David's Lord. How he can come after David in his lineage, but how he precedes David in existence because he's always been. Explain that better, Rick. I can't. He just has. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 1, 14 tells us, And the Word became flesh. So, Jesus is God. And Jesus said in John 8, 58, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. What? I am. The great I am. I love that name that God chose for himself because it's the always present. God is not the I was. He is not the I will be. He is the I am. No matter where we are, he's there. No matter where we've been, he was there because he is ever present. Jesus said, that's me. John 16, 28. Jesus said, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. And I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. I'm going back where I came from. Where is that? Yamim Olam. Days of eternity. Revelation 22.13, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Here's the thing. Messiah is greater far than man can tell. And I want to really drive this home because I, I, most of us in here believe in Jesus. Most of us accept the concept of heaven, accept the concept of Jesus being the Son of God, come into the world, and, and, and one with the Father, we even accept that. But I don't know if we completely are grasping who this Jesus is. And I'll come back to that thought. He's not a Moses. Moses was a man, great prophet, but a man. He's not an Elijah. Elijah was just a man, another great prophet, but just a man. Jesus is all of that and more. He's prophet, he's priest, he's king, but he's more than that. There is nobody like Jesus. Past, present, or future. He is the only one. He's the only God become man who is now God and man. The easiest way to miss Messiah is just keep him in the manger. Keep him in the box of human limitation. Well, I don't do that. I, believe, I think all of us do that from time to time. When we don't really think Jesus can impact my situation. His goings forth from eternity past. Isaiah supported that, by the way, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, when he said, For a child will be born to us. That's his humanity. And a son will be given to us. That's his divinity. Isaiah covers both in that one verse. And so the question is, do you, do I ask yourself, do I believe in a Messiah that exceeds all hope or thought? Do I believe in a Jesus who is far greater than an historical figure or or a leader of a religious movement? Do I accept him as far beyond my understanding? Paul writes in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I don't know about you, but I can ask for an awful lot. And I've got quite a vivid imagination. And Paul says, oh, he's beyond all that. You're not even close. This Messiah But it wasn't just the person of Messiah that Herod's scribes missed. It was also, or the person, it was the purpose. The purpose of Messiah, along with the person, is greater than human conception. Look at verse 3. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child, and then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. In two verses, Micah covers the first and second coming of Messiah. Verse 2 is the first coming, the first advent, if you will, of Messiah's coming, Jesus' first coming. Verse 3 is not about the first coming of Jesus. It's about the second. 
Look at verse 3 again. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Now, there are some commentators who say she who is in labor is Mary and the child is Jesus. And God will give them up until that time. The Jewish people have been given up far longer than that. As a matter of fact, they have been given up for the last 2,500 years. It's what the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles. Jesus said they will fall by the edge of the sword, they will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Luke 21, 24. Let me ask you, in the first coming of Jesus, were the times of the Gentiles fulfilled? No. Did all the people, as verse 3 says, the remainder of his brethren return to the sons of Israel when Jesus came the first time? No. We are still, right now, at this point in history... We are right in the middle of verse 3. Right in the middle of verse 3. That is, therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. That's happened. In fact, it happened in this generation. Because she who is in labor in that verse was Israel. And the child Israel has birthed is the nation of Israel. Birthed in 1948. And then, after that birth, after that occurrence, the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and we already watch as the Jewish people are in return. Not like they will be yet. Even for all the return to Israel we have seen, all of the aliyah, they call it, going up to Israel that's taking place, not even close to what's about to happen. But it, it, it follows the birth of this nation. As Isaiah told us, Isaiah 66, verse 7, you've heard me read this before. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Her pain came. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Now that is talking about Jesus. And then the pain comes after. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in a day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. 1948, May 14th, the nation of Israel born overnight. Yeah, you've talked about that, Rick. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Remember, Micah's a Hebrew prophet speaking Hebrew prophecies to Hebrew people about a Hebrew Messiah. This is all Jewish in context. And there is first a birth, and then there is a following after that, a massive regathering of the remainder of the Jewish people. And as I said, we are right in the middle of verse 3 right now in history. If someone asks you what time it is, just take them right there. That's that's right there. What time is it? It's Micah 3a. (laughs) Continuing on, verse 4. And he will arise and shepherd in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Literally, he will stand up and feed. The word shepherd isn't used there. It's feed. And the indication is as of a shepherd feeding his flock. He will stand up and feed. But what does Micah mean? He says he will do so in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. In the name of the Lord, his God. If I was speaking this in Hebrew, what I might say is that Messiah is going to come in the Hashem of Yahweh. He's going to come in the name of Yahweh. In the name of God. Why? Because he's God. Because that's his name. And he is the one who's coming. He's going to come in perfect harmony with the name, the nature, the strength, the character of Yahweh because Jesus is one with the Father. And again, what we're pushing at here and what what Mike is trying to help us see is the greatness of the person and the purpose of Jesus far beyond our understanding. This is huge. Jesus said, if I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe me. John chapter 10, verse 37. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. What works? He gave the blind sight. He helped the deaf hear. He made the lame to walk. Isaiah prophesied that would happen. He raised the dead to life. These are the works of God. These are the works of the Father. And Jesus says, these are my works. Look at them. Who do you see? And continuing on in verse 4. 
says they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. Another clue, when this happens, they're going to stay put. When this happens, the Jewish people are not going to be driven out of their land again. They are there for good. And and I believe and have said that the nation of Israel is not going to disappear on the face of the earth. They're back, baby. They're staying put. And they will continue to grow in the strength of Messiah. But I love the word he uses here in verse 4. It's remain. They will remain. Literally, they'll sit down. It's the same word used back in chapter 4, verse 4, which says, each of them will sit down under his vine and under his fig tree. They're going to sit down. It, it speaks of security. It speaks of, of absolute peace. It, it speaks of everything finally being right with the world. How is this possible? Verse 5, this one will be our peace. Micah has just laid out the countdown to peace. Not to a holiday that will come and go like so many boxes and bows, but to the real abiding everlasting peace that can only come to this world by Jesus. Now, I love Christmas. I do. It's one of my favorite times of the year. Many of you are like that. Of course, even thinking about Christmas in August is a little disturbing. And it wears me out. I told Cheryl I got that iPhone app just just to play it this morning. I'm going to take it off my phone because I could not do that. I kid you not, every day to look at that thing, 127. 126! I can feel the Christmas noose beginning to tighten. I like thinking about Christmas. But it's a passing thing. And it always is. And you know, there are people who get the blues every year the day after Christmas. The depression sets in. All the fun, the excitement, the games, the gifts, it's all over. And now the debt sits real heavy. (laughs) And we all wonder, why did we do that? What was the purpose of, of that? We're talking about a peace unlike any the world has ever seen. The person of Messiah fulfilling the purpose of Messiah brings the peace of Messiah. And this is where we get to application. The peace of Messiah, number three, it's greater than all human comprehension. And I would submit to you that this morning, the peace of Messiah is perhaps greater than we have considered. For me this week, pouring over this, thinking through it, I don't know if I can even express to you the realization that I'm beginning to have. I'm going to try. Now, Paul gives an amazing treatment of Messiah's peace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, study that on your own time. We're not going to do it this morning. But he talks about how Jew and Gentile are brought together to make one new man, thus establishing peace. And then he quotes from Micah chapter 5, verse 5, saying, he is our peace. But the thing is, that's not what it says. Look at verse 5 again. This one will be our peace. Is your word our in italics there? Cross it out. It doesn't belong in the verse. The translators put it there. He is peace. Period. He is peace. It's a noun. Jesus is peace. Micah didn't say Jesus will bring peace. Jesus will provide peace. Jesus will conquer and make peace. No. He says Jesus is peace. In and of himself. The peace of God is not a nebulous, spiritual, ethereal uh, concept. It's not just a a feeling. The peace of God is Christ Jesus. The peace of God is the Messiah. Yeah, we get that, right? No, listen. He is peace. So why didn't the scribes recognize Messiah of, of Bethlehem? They knew the prophecy, but they didn't believe the person. They didn't get him. They didn't understand what all the prophets had said about this Messiah who is to come. They had a form of godliness while denying its power. And my friends, it's the same reason people still go hungry today. What do you mean? The bread of heaven was born in the house of bread. 
the little Christmas bakery of Bethlehem, so that people could be fed, so that people would never have to hunger or thirst again. Again, John said, John, uh, Jesus said, John 6:35, "I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe." All the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. He is peace. Now Israel is in the final countdown. The final countdown to peace. And there's going to be some major turmoil before it hits. When it hits, it will be forever. But listen. While they're in the countdown to peace, not only as a condition, but the coming of the person of peace himself... You don't have to be. I don't have to be. What are you saying, Rick? We don't have to wait for the peace to come. He came. And we can know peace. You've seen the bumper sticker, no Jesus, no peace, no Jesus, no peace. You know, the, the, the downside of bumper stickers is sometimes they make superficial what is incredibly profound. Let me put this into context for you. Let me give you some application. What does this mean? You've all heard the heart-wrenching news about Robin Williams' suicide this week. It's all over the papers. It's all over the magazines and the news and online and Facebook. And everybody's talking about how tragic it is. And it is tragic. This is a guy who brought nothing but joy and laughter to people. One of the funniest people who, uh, of our entire generation. And people, all kinds of... of Comments are being made and discussion about how could this happen and what did we miss and what's going on with Robin Williams and and all of that. And I know I did this last week, but I'm going to share a Facebook post with you. I I, I promise not to keep doing this. (laughs) But I saw so many posts this last week of people saying, Robin Williams, rest in peace. And I would read that and go, especially if a Christian said that, hey, rest in peace. You know what? There's no such thing as soul sleep. You don't die and rest unless you're in the Lord. But all these different posts. So, so here's one I got to read to you. This is my friend Isaac, Isaac Hamilton. Um, Isaac lives down in Oregon. He's a friend of mine. We worked together in youth ministry several years ago. Great guy. And I noticed this post and I started reading through this. Here's what he wrote. I find myself increasingly saddened by the passing of Robin Williams. Yes, we are sans his talent, which was immeasurable. Mostly, though, he was just searching for someone or something to make him feel the same way he made us feel. Isaac writes, that person is Jesus. He who waits with his arms stretched wide desires you to lay your burdens at his feet and allow him to be what gives you worth. There isn't anyone or anything else that can free you. And I read Isaac's post and I went, that's the best thing I've seen so far. Isaac nailed it. The issue is Jesus. The lack in Robin Williams' life. Jesus. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm not sitting here to judge where Robin Williams is at. That's not the point of this. But I was amazed at the responses that Isaac got. Here's another post. This from an unbeliever. So he wouldn't have killed himself if he'd only found Jesus. That's the most insulting thing I've yet seen regarding his death. It's also insulting to his friends and family, who no doubt loved him very much more than the family of God could have. You wouldn't have said this if he died in a car crash. Such a lack of understanding regarding mental illness is on par with Scientology and should be mocked. And I immediately thought, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. He goes on, the days of sending demons into a herd of pigs are over. Wow, I hope not. Maybe the reason Christianity is on the decline in this country, and it's not. But maybe it is, this guy is saying, is because people are tired of being insulted all the time. Sorry to hit you with both barrels, Isaac, but I don't tolerate Bronze Age preaching on my news feed. Life is too short, and I see enough religious barbarism on the evening news. Goodbye. Yeah, wow. That's what I said. I'm like, 
dude, someone's got some baggage. (laughs) And then there was another post. Oh, there were dozens. I'm only giving you two. A believer's response to what Isaac had to say. While I completely agree that as Christians we are blessed to be able to turn to Jesus and other believers with our burdens, the sad reality is being a Christian doesn't preclude us from mental illness. Depression is an illness, like cancer. Many of those who were outside of Christ have and will continue to find the peace that only Jesus brings when coming into a relationship with Him. And I'm reading along, and so far I'm going, I I, I track what she's saying. She's trying to, to walk this out with grace. And then she says, But there are those inside of the church that continue to struggle against overwhelming feelings of hopelessness and are convinced it is somehow their fault because of a lack of faith. And I read that and thought, Yeah? They must not have enough. Or believe enough, or haven't prayed enough, or Jesus would have taken their pain away. Mental illness is often seen through a Christian science lens by the church. We need more than faith to be freed from it. She said those who have sought treatment through counseling and or medication can often feel stigmatized or ashamed because they hear all too often that faith and being in a small group should be enough. Here's the thing. Both responses completely missed Isaac's point. And the second one actually bothered me more than the first. But you need to understand something. If you're in counseling, if you're taking antidepressants, if you're taking some form of medication, I do not deny the physiological elements of so much mental anguish. I know about this gang. I have seen it. I have people close to me dealing with it. In intense ways. I've seen medications work wonderfully and be incredibly helpful. I know what a lot of the research is into some of the psychological, especially depressions and anxieties, that there is a difference in the brain and there are physiological things going on. I get all of this. And I understand that in this church this morning, there are people sitting here who are in counseling and it helps. And there are people who are sitting here who are taking antidepressant medications, and it helps. I understand that. And I know we're in a very sick, very hurting, very broken world. But Jesus came and said, Mark 2.17, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus said, I I came for that. I came for those problems. I came to deal with those maladies, those issues in your lives. Now, even as I say this, I know there are some who would say, "Ah, you're walking a fine line there, Pastor. Because what I hear you saying is Jesus is enough. And if that's what you heard me say, you are right. Jesus is enough. Just not the Jesus that so many believe in. The Jesus who's another Moses. The Jesus who did and said great things. The Jesus who is Son of God. But but you know what? He's not here right now. He's there. And I'm here and here is bad. And so Robin Williams took his life. Did you know that Mother Teresa suffered from severe depression? Mother Teresa did. She said, If every day I have to go through this to bring me closer to the Lord, then so be it. Jesus walked by a man who was blind from birth and his apostles, his disciples all said, who sinned to cause this? Whose fault was this is the question. And you may feel that way. You sit in church and you're suffering from depression and you're like, this is my fault. If I could only have more faith, I could get rid of this. If, If I could only pray better, if I only knew more of the Bible, if I only went to more church stuff, I could get rid of this and you're still missing Jesus. Because the the answer is not there. You will not be able to study your way out of anxiety. Oh, the Bible helps. Don't get me wrong. But not as a tool to get better. Rather as a tool to get closer to the one who heals. To Jesus. Anyway, they said, who sinned? This man or his parents? Jesus said, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. You guys are looking for blame. Let me explain this to you. It was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. God, Messiah, Jesus. 
And then Jesus goes on to heal him of his blindness. Do you realize that that man born blind was born blind that God would be glorified at that age in his life? He went through, what, 35 years? I don't know how old he was, 35, 40 years old of blindness so that he could receive sight and God would get the glory for it. And we still talk about that today. Some might say, well, that's not really fair. I don't think the guy, once he received his sight, said that wasn't fair. (laughs) Jesus said it was neither this man's sin nor his parents, but so the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So understand what I'm saying here. It is not just that Jesus can bring peace or that you can get it in church or pick it up in a small group. Or even in praying, what we miss, what Herod's scribes missed, and the reason why we still struggle throughout our lives is we misunderstand He is peace. He is peace incarnate in and of Himself. Peace is not achieved by my faith. Peace is not achieved by my choosing the right words in prayer. Truth is, my faith is wobbly and my prayers are weak. And if you're anything like me, you can go two or three days and realize, I haven't talked to God. And there are those who react to preaching that says, Jesus is peace. And if you go to him, he can heal whatever the disease, malady, illness is. Whether it's a disease that puts you in ICU or it's a disease that you struggle with silently. In your brain. He is the healer. And I know people who have said, you know, I struggle with this. I have prayed and he hasn't taken it away. My, my answer to you is when was the last time? When was the last time you took this to Jesus? Yesterday morning? Did you today? How about ten minutes ago? Truth is, a lot of the maladies in our lives are because God is saying, if you will just come to me constantly, we can deal with this together. But we don't. Why don't we? Because we don't recognize that he is peace. Which is much more than him just bringing it. Do you see what I'm saying? He is greater in person. He is greater in purpose. He is greater in peace than all human perception, conception, or comprehension. And Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives you, I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He is peace. And if we're willing to see Him as He is... He's more than enough. Let's pray together. Father, I feel like I'm walking a very thin line here between the kind of the faith movement that says just name it and claim it and the other side that recognizes the reality of heartache and pain and struggle in our lives sorrows and depression and all those things and all I can come to at the end of this is the recognition that Lord Jesus you are the peace we so long for we so desire and Father I pray would you draw us to the Son Jesus said no one can come to me unless the Father draws him my prayer for our fellowship For all that is going on, unknown to me, but known to you, that you will draw us closer to Jesus, into the presence of Jesus, to be surrounded by the peace that is Jesus. And in so doing, fathers, you fill us up with the Son, drive out the anxieties. Lord, drive away the depression. Lord, remove the sorrows because... Jesus is filling this place. And we come begging you, Father, to teach us what it means to have our eyes fixed constantly on Jesus Christ. Lord, you are the Messiah whose goings forth are from days of eternity. You can certainly make radical changes in this little life. Lord, if you can come from Podunk, Bethlehem, you can work in my life. 
I pray You will work in all of ours and draw us to You in Jesus' name. Amen.